Welcome everyone to another CTC Software webinar. My name is Sean Zerbis, Technical Evangelist at CTC Software, and in today's discussion, we're going to take a look at the Hive CMS and go through a fairly comprehensive introduction to the tool set. As always, our webinars are recorded, and also, as always, if you have questions while we're going through some of this content, I encourage you to throw them into the questions window, and I will keep an eye on that and try and answer them live while we're talking about whatever that topic happens to be. In some cases, I may keep your questions until the end, but I will try to answer them as live as I possibly can. Um, in today's discussion, talking about the Hive CMS, we're going to help make sure that you can be certain your Revit users truly have a single source of truth for all of their content that they might need for assembling a Revit project model and useful in other design apps as well. This is really important for success on projects. You, you absolutely do not want people searching around all over the place trying to find stuff and if they can't find it going to some outside source because that just costs time. We want to reduce the, the, how much, uh, the, the amount of time that users spend searching for stuff and helping encourage them to find the exact right content. That's key. And beyond just Revit families, again, other content, find the right standards documentation, making sure that everybody is working in the same way and finding the same content from that single source of truth, that really does impact your firm's bottom line. It really does help make sure your projects are more successful, less prone to errors. So we've been working for years, actively working to help streamline this whole process of working in Revit, working with design, working with engineering processes. And that led us to put together this tool set called Hive. And we've built this tool a while ago. We've been continually, re continually refining it based on your input, your feedback to put together what we feel is the best content management system for Revit. And today, we're going to take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to show you how Hive can really improve Revit and user productivity and reduce frustration overall. We feel that's pretty key. I'm going to take you through how BIM managers can be proactive about solving project and content issues. Some of the features inside the Hive CMS and other aspects of Hive do really allow you the ability as BIM managers to be incredibly proactive. Hopefully this will help you understand the impacts of your project's bottom line, your return on investment, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, you know, how much time people spend doing things and how much time they can save with Hive. And then at the very end, I wanna show you how you can get started in Hive if you're not already using it, or even if you are for that matter, and you know, if you aren't already using it, how you can get in and use Hive in a free kind of beta type environment. Try it out for yourself. See what it, how it works for you at your firm after you've seen what this can do. So why Hive? What, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Really in Windows, there are tons, tons of files, tons of family files. Just recently I took a look at the, the Revit out of the box library for US Imperial alone. And for the last four versions, there's 12,000 approximately families, not just files, but families specifically in those directories for just the out of the box US Imperial. Most of us further customize that. We of course compound and add to that. We may have Imperial and metric at play in our firms, at which point we just doubled that number if we have to support multiple versions of Revit. It's not a small problem. And the problem is Windows file structure, especially with our own content, gets out of hand really quickly. File name is not always enough to identify what it is you're trying to drop into your project. And that's a real problem because in a lot of cases, it's the data inside the content that we care about the most. It's not just the file name. And in some cases, it's not the file at all that we're after, but what is truly inside of it, like in the case of project-hosted content, system families like walls and floors and duct types, typical details, schedules, those kinds of things aren't families that we can save out. They exist in another project, and we have to know where to go find that, and that takes time. So the file name is not always enough to identify. And this, especially today, especially in the time that we all are existing right now, when we're out of the office, when we're working from home, it is 
far more difficult to gain access to these files, especially if you don't have a really quality VPN system set up, or if you don't have virtual machines set up, it can be rather frustrating when you're working from home trying to get these files and you're trying to access this stuff when you're out of the office. And even before the times that we're all in right now, when we were just like at a client meeting with a client sitting in their office or sitting in a coffee shop trying to work, trying to get access to those files, frustrating, very frustrating. So how can we solve all this? Well, I wanna show you that today in the Hive environment. So let's go live into Revit. I'm not big on death by PowerPoint, so we're gonna go live into Revit and take a look at how this works. In fact, I'm actually gonna cancel out of this little PowerPoint here, and we're gonna to go to my desktop and take a look at this. I'm gonna start on my desktop. Out here, I have installed the Hive CMS, and it's a Windows program. That's key because that means that Hive can work beyond the boundaries of Revit. It can be useful for more than just your Revit designers in your office. I'm gonna open up the Hive CMS here. It's gonna open up in my current latest version, 21.0.9 in this case. It's actually a little bit early. Uh, I'm, I'm doing some dev testing here. This should hopefully work fine today, it ought to. Um, in this Hive environment, this allows me the ability to search for whatever I'd like. So, I don't know, let's say I wanted to know how to deal with shared coordinates. I can type that in, and I probably wanna make sure that I don't have a Revit version filter set here. And this will come back with, how do you establish shared coordinates? Fantastic, right? I can open this up, opens up in whatever my native PDF viewer is. So this is 100% usable outside the boundaries of Revit in general. Now I do have Revit open on my computer, which is why it recognizes that I have Revit 21 and 2018 open. They're both open right now, just minimized. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up Revit 2018. As I do that, and as I activate Revit, that's Revit 2021, let's get the right version of Revit here first while I'm talking. As I go into Revit 2018, you might notice that Hive, the CMS, automatically here filters for Revit 2018. It knows Revit 2018 is a design app, it knows how to tie into it, and it also will automatically set my version filters to make sure that I'm finding 2018 specific content. That's actually an option, and I'll show you how to turn that off or on a little bit later in today's discussion, but that is a feature that you can leverage here. And really kind of before I start digging too deep into this, let's go back to the home page and just kind of look at what this, what this kind of allows me. Basic search bar, basic navigation on the side. Depending on my rights, I may have fewer buttons or the, all the buttons like I happen to have right here. There's also a main home page here, which allows me quick access to things like libraries and tags and Revit category auto filters just from a single click. I can quickly trigger saved searches. I can also get access to saved searches specifically while I'm over here on the search tab where I spend most of my time. I can simply drop down this little uh, option right here and get access to these pre-saved searches. And these save searches is actually where I'm gonna start some of the main part of this discussion today. Because a lot of the times I might go in here and search for something, basic search term, on the far right side over here within the search page, I can further filter that if need be. I can limit what the results are giving back. Like in this case, it's limiting me to 2018 results. It has to relate directly to Revit 2018. Or maybe I want it to limit it to a specific Revit category or maybe a specific display unit, whether it's imperial or metric in its units of measure in the families. This might be very useful for those of you who work on international projects. I can also filter for specific libraries right here. So if I had a special client, XYZ company, and I wanna only use their content, I can filter for that. Or if I have maybe subdivisions in my firm where there's maybe my main corporate work, but then I have an MEP team and I want them to be able to find just MEP content, I can do that. I can, I can very specifically organize this in a way that makes sense. You'll notice here that absolutely none of this has anything to do with Windows folder structure. Nothing whatsoever. Because Windows folder structure is, super arbitrary. I like properties that are far more automatic with the only thing really being a main bucket into which things are dumped. So let's say that I wanted to go ahead and start a new project. Well, I'm gonna go up here and use this saved search called templates that's actually shared with the company. And as I do that, it searches everything 
And because my filters page is open, I will see that it's filtering in templates. It's looking for 2018 stuff and basically just saying only give me back Revit stuff. And so I have, because Revit 2018 is my active version, my starter project right here. This is an RVT file. It's uh, not a normal Revit template. It's a Revit starter project, work sharing pre-enabled. So I can open this up, detach from central, preserving my work sets. And this is gonna drop me into a project environment. And in this case, even prompt me for which work sets to open by default. I can make that choice and I can begin doing some work here in this background project file. Now for a minute, I need to transition away from Hive just for a second. I need some floor plans inside here because my template doesn't have any floor plans. So I'm gonna use a different CTC software tool called View Creator to very quickly take the levels that pre-exist in this building. And I'm going to check a couple of boxes here so I can just generate for myself a handful of floor plans uh, real quick. Let's add those to my list, create some views. There we go, 20 floor plan views generated based on my standard from my template. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the general floor plan and we're gonna pull Hive back to the foreground here. Uh, and with this Hive, because of how I'm using it, I am pinning it to the foreground at this point because when I click into Revit, I want my Hive to stay on top of everything. I do truly have multiple monitors in front of me, but you can't see the other monitors. So I'm putting Hive on top of my Revit session and I don't wanna have to keep going back to my uh, taskbar to bring it forward. So that's why I'm pinning it to the foreground. It'll be persistent here. You'll see it the entire time I'm working. That is an option, of course. I can tell it not to pin to the foreground, but that's what I'm doing here. All right, with this all set up, what I wanna do is draw in some walls, okay? If I use the wall command in my project, my template that I just started from, my template has basic generics in it by design. I don't want this thing flooded with every possible conceivable wall type because with every possible conceivable wall type, then I may only use a small percentage of them. So why bloat my project with trash that I'm not gonna be using? I like to have people bring in exactly what it is they need when they need it. And that's what Hive is for. So I can do some preliminary design and lay something out in my building with some basic wall types. And then when the time is right, I can go up here to my search bar and say, you know what? I'm looking for uh, type A walls. I'm just gonna put in the term type A and it's gonna give me back some search results throughout my 43,000 entries of content in my Hive environment that somehow match type A. And when it brings me that back, type A happens to match most closely my wall type naming. So my six wall types that say type A explicitly float to the top. Now there's other things in my library because I didn't tell Hive walls. I just put in type A. This is like going to Google and putting in fencing, right? You might get shots of people doing uh, foil fencing, sword fighting. You might get shots of, uh, you know, uh, hits on, on tornado fencing for in front of your house, right? Like fencing is a generic term, just like type A is generic. I haven't been specific enough. If I really truly only wanted walls, then maybe what I do is go over here to my Revit categories and say, you know what, just give me back walls. That's all that I want, just walls and reapply this. And now it's gonna go and search anything type, anything A, anything type A, most relevant stuff floats to the top. And then other things that are also kind of within that realm will also be in this list. Regardless whether I filtered or not, the wall type that I wanted actually was within the first six results. It's this guy right here. I wanted the four and seven eighths inch wall type. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simply double click on this. Now this wall type, keep in mind, does not exist in my project yet. If I draw a wall, that wall type's not here yet. All I have is generics. So let's, let's get that wall type into my project. I'm just gonna double click on this. It's gonna grab that wall type out of a project from the cloud because of how I have my hive set up, loads it into my project, initiates the wall command, and now I'm drawing explicitly that one wall type in my project environment. See, natively for me to bring that in, I would have had to have opened up some other project file someplace that I knew had that wall type in it, transition back to this project that didn't have it, use manage transfer project standards up here. Um, there isn't a project right now, but it would open up a dialog box. And then I would choose from that just the wall types, but I would get every single wall type from that 
host project, whatever that was. It wouldn't just be my active project. And that's frustrating because now again, I'm bloating my project unnecessarily with a bunch of wall types. I could also do copy paste from another project, but that's kind of dangerous. In some cases, you can bring corruption into your project. You can bring extra levels. You didn't want um, associations and things you might not want to be bringing in. But so this is like the safest way to bring it in. It's very surgical. It brought in just the one that I asked for. And that's key because now I'm not bloating the project and I have just the one that I wanted. Now, if you wanted more than one, this is a question I get a lot. How can I bring more than one wall type? Say I wanted the eight inch and the six inch walls as well. I didn't grab those. Can I load them in? Absolutely. I can just hit the load button right here. It's going to grab those two wall types and it's going to load them into my project directly. And then they will be available for me to use once it's done loading those wall types into my project, which is fantastic because then I don't have to, again, go to some other project model, find the stuff, load it in, all the things. This was just a super simple way for me to begin loading that content into my design environment and getting those walls. They'll show up here in a minute. Now, in addition to that, maybe what I wanted to do was uh, now find a door. So here in my project, if I start drawing in a door, it's going to tell me that there aren't any door families loaded in this project. Do I want to load one? Well, if I wanted to load one normally and I hit yes, this is going to put me out into loading a family and browsing through directories and maybe finding what I'm looking for and maybe not. What we notice that people do frequently is they'll go to doors, they'll look at a door and be like, oh yeah, door, double glass, load that up. Load it in their project. They realize it's not the right one. They load again. They load another family in. And of course, they never purge. And eventually, they get to the one door it was that they wanted, like this door single panel, perhaps, or the door um, you know, double, I don't know, flush panel, something, whatever. Whatever they were looking for, they might eventually go find that. So what I want to do here is I want to actually search for something that's going to be more appropriate for what I want, like swing single, maybe. I just want to search for that. Oh, and I also have my walls filter here still set. So let's clear out all the filters here and apply that and come back with a search. And I'm actually going to close out Hive for a second here because it's in the middle of thinking it's supposed to load something that I don't actually have out there. And let's just reopen this real quick. I was trying to load in a wall type that I remember having deleted uh, from the Hive environment or from, from the, the actual file from my, my uh, system and I can't find it. So we're going to pull this back up and we're going to try that search again. Swing, single. There we go. So this is going to come back with anything in my library that somehow matches swing single. And in fact, the first thing that shows up is door single panel. Fantastic. Now, I might also find other things that match the word swing. So if I scroll down, there might be, you know, some single double hung windows or there might be swinging double doors or things like that. If I truly wanted doors, once again, I could filter exclusively for doors over here if that was what I was looking for. Or if this is a particular search that I run on a fairly regular basis, maybe I have a saved search over here that already has swing single or single set and maybe it's got the Revit category of doors, and maybe it knows what version of Revit to play with here. It might know all of that information. So um, if I was to actually run that right here, like uh, out of the box, single doors, it's gonna run exclusively that search single on a specific version and a specific category of Revit, and it'll come back with those search results very quickly there for me, okay? Um, so with this, uh, and, and by the way, if I'm loading in a bunch of content and uh, let's just reset that because I want only doors. There we go. If I end up with more than whatever my you know, maximum number is, I can always, of course, hit load more at the bottom. This one here, because I'm filtered down to a reasonable number and I've got my current setting set to a hundred items, show me at least a hundred things on a page. Um, we find that when people have more than 100, it's usually better to kind of do some filtering, though if they don't want to filter, they can always hit load more, um, you know, so that way they can get more stuff uh, available to them. But here with the, the, the door that I was looking for, door single panel, I'm going to load this. I can load this into my project, right? I can double click on this. It's going to load it in. This particular door out of the box with Revit has a type catalog. And so here with you know these doors, um, I could choose to load from any of the versions that are relevant to me, defaults to 2018, since that's the version that I'm in. And I can grab specifically the doors that I'm looking for, 
33, uh, 34 inch by 84, 36 inch by 84, maybe a 30 inch by 84, load those selected types. And because type catalog, of course, I can grab more. I can get as much as I you know, would like or as little as I'd like here. But let's say I was also looking for, say, my corporate doors. Maybe I didn't build type catalogs for my corporate doors, like this one, no type catalog. In fact, if I show the details about this, you'll notice type catalog is not checked. It does have a bunch of types inside that door, but the type catalog here is not coming from a type catalog, it's coming directly from the door itself. In Revit, if I was to load that, if I was to load that into my project natively, I would get all of the types. When I load this through Hive though, Hive actually has a special feature where it'll say, oh, you know what? I see you've got a bunch of types. You might wanna be selective anyway. I can choose just the two that I care about and I can load them into my project exclusively. And over here, I'll notice I got just the two types that I really wanted. So over here, I can start dropping in these doors, place them wherever I feel is appropriate, swap other types, you know, you name it. You do whatever the design is you need to do and it'll let you drop that content in. Um, in my file here, you might notice if I expand out my schedules and quantities, all I have is a basic room schedule. I don't actually have a door schedule, but I want one. So what I'm gonna do is clear all my settings here and I'm gonna tell this that I'm looking for a door schedule. And it's gonna come back and again, search my 43,000 entries of content. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab my door frame schedule here and bring this into my project. The goal with the Hive CMS, as mentioned, is that your users are finding exactly what you want them to find. Because this content comes out of my library with my standards, my doors, my door schedules, I can pretty well guarantee that as soon as somebody finds a door or as soon as somebody finds a schedule and they drop that into their project, that it should follow my standards. That's the entire intent here. And I'm able to really laser focus them on where this is going. Now, my schedule, my wall types, my floor types, my railings, my typical sheets. So if I go here to a uh, typical details search that I've got pre-saved for Revit uh, detail views, or I've got uh, typical sheets here pre-saved, ready to go with schedules on them, with typical detail views in them. All of this content for me is coming out of a single Revit project model, about 150 meg in file size, give or take, 150 to 200 meg in file size. And I've told Hive about that project, and I've pulled specific content out of that project for all of my walls, my floors, my details, my schedules, and that's in the Hive environment now searchable so that the end user, when they're dropping stuff into their project environment, they don't have to cache in a memory a 200 meg file. Hive has optimized that so that they get the fastest drop of those schedules right into their project environment. So that door schedule, that wall schedule, that typical detail, they're all coming from the same project, which means if you're using other CTC tools like Type Swapper and Project Cleaner and other BIM management tools, you can do that once in one place, in one warehouse file of content, and then tell Hive about that and save yourself all kinds of headaches, all kinds of extra management, because you can manage it from a BIM management point of view far, far more easily. Now, I can keep searching in Hive. I can search forever. I can find you all kinds of things and show you all kinds of extra details about information. But there's one more major search that I wanna show you. Here in this environment, I'm going to search a building product manufacturer. So this will be something you might see in the manufacturer parameter value in Hive. I'm gonna search Titus. This is a, a company that's usually associated with mechanical engineering. They make air terminals, they make VAV boxes and other mechanical equipment. And in this content, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that file name alone is not enough to find what I'm looking for. This return uh, modulinear slot diffuser right here doesn't in any way indicate to me that this is a Titus component. It's fairly generic and it's graphic and that's okay. Same thing over here with this modular core diffuser or this supply perforated diffuser, whatever. These are all somewhat generic in their graphics. Down below here, there's an energy recovery unit sitting down here, right? Whatever, I've got this content at my fingertips, but I wanna know like, this was Titus that I searched. Why did this even show up, right? Why, why is this here? I'm gonna turn off my filters because you'll notice I'm getting all Revit categories. There's no filter there. I'm just looking at 2018 content right now. That's what it's filtering for and that's it. 
It's looking for Titus in 2018 content. Why is it coming back with these specific results right here? Well, I'm gonna expand out my details. We're gonna take a look at this real quick. In the details, let me make this just a little bit wider so we can see this a little more clearly here. In these details here, um, in the parameters, if I filter them down intentionally to Titus, you'll notice that for each of these three different types, Titus is found in the property of manufacturer and other places inside of here as well. Hive instantly, when I searched, searched file name, searched type names, searched in inside the types for all the parameters and their values, and it looked for anything that matched Titus, and it came back with these search results in less than a second or two. Through 43,000 entries of content in my library, came back with these results. So lightning fast ability to find everything that I could need. And it also tells me in this case that whatever that family happened to be that I have selected, I forget which one it was that I had picked, but whatever one that was that I picked, um, it relates to Revit 2019 and Revit 2018. Those are the two versions it's associated to. There might be others, there might be less, whatever, but um, in this case, that particular family relates to those two versions of Revit. And of course, I can use those in any future version of Revit if I want to, but I can't use it anything older than Revit 2018. This also, uh, with this supply modular core diffuser right here that I have selected, if I'm using this and I drop it into a project and it doesn't work as I might expect or it breaks somehow, if I've allowed my team to do so, my team members can write reviews on the content. They can leave me feedback. They can rate it. This particular content's never been rated, but they can choose to write a review and, and rate content. And that way I can actually, as a BIM manager later on, look through my content and find stuff that's poorly rated or that has feedback that maybe I need to handle. Now, if there's not content here that I've looked for, I'm like, oh yeah, let's find, um, let's find train. Okay, I have train content. Let's find carrier. Okay, I've got that too. Oh no, I don't. I have carrier components. The name is fixture carrier, but not carrier manufacturer. Okay, good to know, right? I'm looking for some specific content. Well, I can actually, as an end user, use the add request button, and that will take me over to the Hive portal and let me create a request for some content. And maybe I actually had downloaded cut sheets for the carrier content that I wanted. Maybe I have a family that I downloaded, or maybe I built one myself. Maybe I modified something else, and I feel like that belongs in the library. I can post that request and I can attach whatever it is I do have so the BIM management team who manages Hive can actually give me back that content in the future after they've reviewed whatever that request happened to be. It's a fantastic way of doing feedback. And yes, there's emails that go along with this as you post requests and as those requests are updated. That said, you know, I've talked a lot about navigating through and how to actually browse content here. How does content actually make its way into Hive? How do you add it? Well, you can do that here from the Add Content tab. In fact, if you have access to the Add Content tab, you can actually add content from any tab. It's actually pretty cool. You can go here to Windows Explorer. You can grab any folder of content, like my Doors folder, and simply drag and drop that. Normally, I can drag and drop. Oh, I can't because I'm in the middle of a meeting. Oh, you got to love it, right? Meetings, they like to, to disable your ability to drag drop. Normally I would drag drop this and it would just drop into Revit and it would automatically bring me to the add content tab and it would allow me the ability to uh, simply see that list of families that were in that folder. Since I can't do that right now because GoToWebinar likes to make it so I can't drag and drop, I'm gonna do add a folder. This is another technique that you can use to add content into Hive. And I'm just gonna go grab that doors folder and this is actually, the yeah, US Imperial doors, perfect, click OK. And what it's gonna do is add those, in this case, 55 components of content directly into Hive. These are Revit families. Now, if I had Revit project components, say that warehouse file, I have a small example that I can open up here. If I go browse for where I've got uh, my warehouse file here, just grab this guy, I'm gonna open this up, not as a local copy, I'm gonna open it up as a, the central file itself. When I open up this file, I can actually grab content out of that warehouse file, out of that project, things like walls and typical details by using the add Revit project elements option. So I can add that directly. Give this thing a second to search it. Maybe I wanna only get walls. This is actually exactly how I got my walls into Hive. 
I selected all the wall category stuff, made sure it was all the things that I actually wanted. I excluded some of the generics here that I didn't want. So I check these and I add those elements directly to my Hive environment and they're ready to be processed as well. All that's left for me to choose is what library this goes to. And these are all libraries that I made. So if this is my standard content, I would add it to my standard library. I would click process and I'd probably go grab lunch and let it rip through and open up those, those families. It usually takes about 30 seconds per entry to scan it on average, 30 seconds per entry to get that loaded in. So in this case, eh, probably approximately 45, eh, 40 minutes, give or take, right? I don't wanna wait for that to happen. So we're gonna skip that processing step and I would let that happen when I wasn't babysitting my laptop. Let's actually go take a look at how to do some more administration and some of the other sort of back end controls. And, and by the way, while I'm sitting here looking at this, if I did have content in other versions, um, say 2019 or 2020 or whatever, as I drop content from Hive, um, it'll just, Hive will just act like normal loading, right? If I drop an older version of content in, it'll just upgrade it for me on demand when I'm placing it. If I'm processing content in here, like my content's all Revit 2018, fantastic. I can, if I want to, if I had mixed versions, 2018 content, 2019 content, 20 content, what I'd probably do is just process it all on Revit 2021. Since I happen to have that design app active, I would process there and let it just upgrade the family temporarily so it can scan the data. And when it's all done, you know, looking at the data and logging that for searchability, it closes the families without saving and uploads the original. So I can actually do a lot of my processing version agnostic sort of, it's in the latest version of Revit. And again, when I drop stuff out of Hive, it'll automatically upgrade. Okay, so I kind of got that out of the way because I know some people often ask that question about version differentials. Let's go talk about how do I do some of the backend management of this? Now, if, if I had the ability to share a screen from say my iPhone or my, my Android tablet or you know whatever, um, I don't know, a Android computer, if you guys are using like Chromebooks or whatever, as long as you have internet access, you can do all of this next step, whether it's on your desktop, in Chrome, or Edge, or you name it, or if it's on your phone, you can do all these next steps. I'm gonna open up the Hive Management Portal, which actually opened up on my other monitor. Let me bring this across. When I open up the Hive Management Portal, and I'm also gonna make Hive go to the background now, it brings me here typically to the home page, and it gives me some basic information. Some notifications might pop up if there's updates. Um, there's also some information about how my CTC add-ins that I've been using, how many times I have opened them uh, and used them in the last X amount of time. There's a dashboard tab. We'll go back to this here in just a minute. Um, if I take a look at the CMS tab, this is where I manage all of the things about the Hive CMS that we've been looking at so far. One of the first things that I recommend, there's like a five-step process that I recommend for any company, any company who's gonna be getting into Hive, five steps. These are the five steps exactly in this order. I recommend after you get your Hive subscription, you go try out for the, for the trial of Hive, you get a free account, whatever, sign up for it. First thing you probably wanna do is go here to settings, the CMS tab, settings, organization, after you log into the, to the Hive portal and from the organization tab here, the sub tab, you're probably gonna wanna make sure that you're allowing your content to be cloud cached in the first place. What this does when you check this box, this makes sure that when Hive processes content, whatever that content is, it also uploads an original copy of that file into the Hive cloud. If you remember in the PowerPoint presentation, I was talking about how people can work from wherever they are working from home, working from a coffee shop, client offices, whatever. Well, for that to work, they have to be able to get access to your content without needing a VPN all the time because internet connections sometimes can be a little bit slower and VPN can be unstable. With cloud content caching, Hive stores your content beyond just your network, it also stores it in the cloud. Now Hive can look to both. It can look to both your local network and to the cloud simultaneously and you have an option here as to which one it prefers. I recommend preferring cloud content. You have this option, check the box on, that'll allow cloud content to be the original destination Hive will try to go to, okay? 
Now, the important note here about cloud content, we don't have caps on how much data you can use, how much you can store. You could use terabytes of data technically if you wanted to. Right now, I'm going through and processing all of the out-of-the-box libraries. It is almost a terabyte of data for all the different countries for four version years of Revit. Hive doesn't care. It's like, yeah, sure, no big deal. It's caching the content in the cloud. It's preferring to go to the cloud when it finds that content. When you drop it in your project, it'll go to the cloud first. If it can't find it in the cloud, and I'll talk about why that's important, it'll go to your local system if it cannot find it in the cloud, if this is checked. If this is unchecked, it'll try to go to your local system first, and if it can't find it there, then it'll try to look in the cloud. But it'll try to go to the cloud first with this option. And this is what I recommend. Step one, go CMS, organization, uh, settings, organization, allow cloud content caching, check, prefer cloud content, check, and save. That's just the first step. By the way, when I was working in Hive and I was mentioning to you that it was automatically filtering for my active Revit version, some companies don't like that. Some people want to always see my active version and all of the older stuff also. That's fine. I checked this box here, auto filter for active design app version. If you don't like that, leave that unchecked, save, and it will then save that as your company-wide setting. All of these settings are corporate-wide. These are not individual user by user. This is for the entirety of the company. But that's step one. Step two is to go to manage libraries, libraries, and because uh, there's actually public libraries coming very soon, the ability for you to actually subscribe to libraries that pre-exist that are common, like the out-of-the-box libraries. That's one of the things I'm processing right now. But these libraries here, you can subjectively make your own buckets of content. I recommend you start with probably four four to start with. Templates for your corporate templates, Word document templates, Excel templates, Revit templates. It's again, beyond Revit content. So templates, standards and procedures, great folder there for all your BIM standards and how procedures are done. You can put all that content into the hive, all of it into that bucket. Uh, Revit content for your company. You may choose to subdivide this, make these a couple of extra smaller buckets by discipline. That's up to you, but at least one Revit content for your company. And if you choose to, a fourth library, which would be Revit out of the box. That library will become unnecessary in the future. In the future, when we publish those, you can simply check that box right there, hit delete, delete that library. It's no longer in your system. It's not something you have to worry about or manage, and you can just subscribe to the public library of out of the box Revit content for whatever country and uh, unit of measure it is that you're looking for from the stock stuff. That'll save you from processing all that stuff if you want. But for now, if you wanted to include it until we get those libraries up, yeah, you can do that. I have a bunch of other things here. I've got some Dynamo libraries because this can interact with Dynamo. I can open up scripts directly from the Hive into the Dynamo app, play it from there. Uh, you can do maybe Revit content by discipline or Revit content for special clients. So like this client right here, Revit content for XYZ, I may not want to put their content in the cloud. There may be a limitation where they say I can't put their content in the cloud. So by default, all of my libraries are cloud hosted, but here I can actually say, you know what? This XYZ content, don't upload that content. So then what will happen, because Hive defaults to going to the cloud first, it'll look to the cloud and go, oh, I don't have this stuff in the cloud, and then it'll force them to go local. Of course, to be able to get access to that, um, you need to make sure that that person is using a VPN connection or is attached to your network, because it has to go to your local network to find it. But it's an option for you, right? To make a library, it's actually really simple. New library, give it a name, Revit content, ABC, whatever and uh, spell things correctly because that's you know, the right thing to do, and create. That's it. Create a, create a library, makes it. This one here happens to be an uploaded library, and that library is now available. Instantly available in the CMS over here. If I go to search and I go to filters, I can actually go right here and be like, oh yeah, look, there's the Revit content ABC. And if I'm over here adding content and I wanted to process content into that ABC library, I can instantly get that content into Revit ABC. Process, and it's gonna be uploaded to that, well, yeah, uploaded to that location because that's an uploaded library. Okay, that's step two. Step three, well, that's actually here in Hive, is to upload a bunch of content. Uh, add it to those libraries that you just made. Get it ready for the users that are gonna be coming in here. What I like to do, as I mentioned before, is use my highest Revit version possible, 
throw all of the Revit families from all the different versions that I'll be playing with, add them to my corporate library right here, tell it to process and go home. I let it process overnight. Let it run when I come back in the morning, most likely, depending on how much content you have, it'll probably already be done, okay? I don't babysit it while I'm letting that content process. I just let it do its thing. I honestly spent about 45 minutes in front of my computer setting up my Hive, going through these five steps that I'm mentioning here right now. And there's plenty of times I let Hive process overnight, but that wasn't time I was spending watching it. I let it do its own thing. Okay, so that was step three, adding content into Hive, which we've talked about how to do, drag and drop from windows or add files, add folders, add stuff from project elements, process in either the latest or an appropriate version of Revit, process it into the right library, and you're done with that step. Step four is a step that I do sometimes while it's processing. Users and groups, and I go to the groups and I establish some basic groups for my company. Maybe you create an everyone group. This is one that almost every company creates, everyone. And as you're adding users, every single user, I always add them to the everyone group personally. And I use that group for some rights later on. Sometimes some of my clients will also do discipline specific groups, especially if you have discipline specific libraries, you might make those. I also typically make myself a BIM manager group. And I might also, like for my Dynamo library, I've got Dynamo power users who I've set up to be managers of that library. There's a couple of different groups you might make, whatever you seem, you know, whatever you think makes sense for your company, but everyone is certainly one that I would make and probably a BIM manager type group is certainly one that I would probably make. And with those groups, a part of this step four, I would typically jump back to the CMS and I'd go back to those libraries that I made and I would add those groups as appropriate to these libraries. So my out of the box or no, my, my corporate Revit content here, I jumped into permissions and in permissions, I added everyone to this library and I gave them the role right here of contributor. This means they can leave feedback on my content. They can rate it, they can comment on it, they can kind of interact with it more than just being able to find it. And you can add a group here by simply searching for a group and you can tell them what their role is, like this is a manager group, and I can add that to the list and simply save it, right, then I'm done, I'm off and running. This might be meaningful for some of my discipline specific libraries if you make those, because I might add my architecture group to an architecture library as contributors. And I might not add my mechanical team to that library, so they can't even find the architectural content potentially. Maybe I want them to find it, maybe I don't. That's up to me and how I wanna have my, my libraries organized. But this is just getting those groups ready to go. I set up all the rights on any of my libraries that I've made. One that I specifically modified here was standards and procedures. And in the permissions for this, I set everyone in my company up as a consumer, not a contributor, meaning they can't leave feedback. All they can do is find the content here. And for you, that might be important. In standards and procedures, this is well where your standards go documented. And if you just hired a new person on who comes from you know, ABC company and they have a different way of doing things, the last thing that I really want in this library is somebody being like, well, at my previous firm, we did things this way. Well, good for you. Go work for your previous firm if you wanna do things that way. At our company, we do things this way, so that's how the standards are. And so I don't want to open up the door for those kinds of conversations within Hive, so I make them just consumers on libraries when I really don't want the feedback. It's an option for you. You don't have to do that, but it's an option. And as I mentioned, my Dynamo library here, everyone can add or can, can contribute, so to speak. They can comment back like this script is broken in blah version of, of Dynamo. But my Power Dynamo users, well, they're a manager level. That means they can continually maintain content that is specifically in this library. You've got a lot of control with Hive about how you want to control the rights and access to different portions. And that's 100% under your umbrella of your control. Okay. That's step four, set that up. You don't have to pre-think everything. You can always change your mind later, but start to set it up a little bit, especially with the everyone group. And then after all your content is pretty much ready to go, you feel pretty confident with it, it's time for step five. And step five is to go out here and add your users into your company. You can either add them individually one by one, first name, last name, email, you can choose what groups they're a part of. Everyone, of course, would go into the everyone group. Some people might go into BIM managers. Some might be Dynamo users. That's up to you. And as they get added to those groups, they instantly gain rights to different parts of the CMS. 
automatically. It's already set. You add a user, you put them in groups, you're done. And then you can also use an Excel type workflow. Maybe, you do, maybe you've got too many users, you don't want to do it one by one by one. You can get a list of all your current users out of here and turn right back around, add a bunch of other users to the Excel file, a bunch of groups as well if you want to, and do group associations and publish that list right back into Hive. And there's also a third way. For those of you who work at much larger companies, you've got hundreds, potentially thousands of users, you probably don't want to be doing Excel-based workflows all the time. And so for you, we have this optional tool here called Active Directory Synchronizer. It's all included with the Hive installer. You can choose to use it or not. But this tool allows you to tie directly into your company's Active Directory and your groups, for that matter, if you want, and get those users to automatically be synchronized when they get created and automatically turned off when they leave your company. That can help save a lot of headache and management. And you simply use the Active Directory groups in the Hive side instead of using groups that maybe you manually created for some of that extra organization. Hive also, by the way, has some background tracking of information. Okay, While I'm working in my project, there's another portion of Hive beyond just content management that is called project activity logging. That's really important because while I'm working, while my users are working, they can be giving me information about the health of their projects. And I can get that information from the Hive portal. I can simply go over here to the dashboard. One part of the Hive user interface here is the dashboard. And keep in mind, you can access this from any web-enabled device, your phones, your tablets, your Chromebooks, your desktop computers, whatever. You can get here and you can understand things like, what is the health of my projects? I can go take a look at a model summary for a specific project that's set up inside of here. I can see which Revit models are actually associated, how much time has been spent, items edited, who's working on them. I can understand some deeper information about the models themselves, work set counts, unenclosed rooms, unenclosed spaces, things like that. I can understand the information about how these models have been performing over time. So earlier today, I opened up one of these projects here and it took 14.72 seconds to open that up. I have that at my fingertips. It's instant. This can be used with BIM 360 models. This can be used with models on your local network. This can be used with Revit server models. It doesn't matter where the models are stored. It can be used with all of them. So you can start tracking this stuff, getting information as a BIM manager near instantly about what's going on in the project, when warnings have potentially manifested, what items are affected, all of that's available. You can also get some stats about how the users are interacting with the CMS itself specifically. How are they searching? When are they searching? Are they searching a lot and not dropping a lot, right? So I can see here, like in my case, I do a lot of demos. I do a lot of searching. You saw me do a lot of searching today and I only dropped a handful of things. So my search drop ratio is rather trash, right? 20, almost 21% of the time I'm dropping something, but almost eight, you no, know, 79% of the time I'm not. If this was in a real company, I would be concerned about the health of my libraries because people are searching a lot and not finding what they're looking for. They're not using a lot of things. I can also see if they're using my save searches that I've built for them or not. If they're doing a lot more manual stuff, maybe I should figure out what that is. I can see about my Revit content, what projects they happen to be located in, what versions of content that is. Uh, top 10 largest families, for example, in my entire libraries. I've got an air compressor here that's 2.16 meg in file size. Interesting to know. That's actually pretty small. That's fine. But I've had in some people's libraries content that's much, much larger than that, right? I can see how my tags are allocated. Hive does have a concept of what's called tagging. So you can subjectively associate your own things to stuff. Like I have an architecture tag. It's associated to 19, almost 2000 elements, um, 1998 elements. So I can see what they're associated to. You can see electrical tags and other kinds of tags. And how many times they're actually used in searches in my libraries. There's a number of tags here that aren't even associated to anything. They just exist. Well, that's good to know. Maybe I want to clean them up so they get out of my list. Right? If I'm in Hive and I'm, I'm in here and I'm trying to search for something as an end user and I go to tags and I see tags that aren't linked to anything, what's the point in even having them so I can get rid of that stuff? Right? But all of that information is available at your fingertips. And if you want to do more with this, I have a lot of customers who are like, man, this information is great, but I want to do more. Good. I'm happy that you want to do more. Here in Downloads, 
you can actually download a Microsoft Power BI template and you can request all of the backend Hive CMS project activity logged data and your users and groups as some files that you can then take into our Power BI template and further customize that data to make it whatever you want. Okay. I did see a question as I was mentioning about tags. Are tags different than searching Revit parameters? They actually are. Revit parameters are automatically gathered. You don't have to do anything subjectively with Revit parameters. So when I'm searching up here carrier or when I was searching Titus or searching whatever, that's automatically digging into the families and finding that. But all of that content might be associated to a simple mechanical tag, like this guy right here, mechanical. I can subjectively grab all of my content that is related to a mechanical type category and tag it as mechanical, but that's me making that association. Where I see tags used most frequently is for things like client specific work, where you might have a project manager who goes in and searches Hive for specific details. They might grab something and they might associate a tag to it that relates to client XYZ, whatever they might be. And then as I select that later on, when my users are searching specifically for content tagged as that, then they'll find those typical details, those sheets, those families, those typical model groups, whatever, that maybe I as a team member have gone through and pre-tagged for them, okay? So there's a lot of different strategies you can use with this, but from the end user's point of view, they're able to search, they're able to filter very efficiently, and you, the BIM manager, if, if you're a BIM manager, you can very easily manage, manipulate, and understand how those tools are being used, okay? All right, let me jump back over here for a minute. And we're gonna do a little bit more in PowerPoint, and then I'm gonna go into the questions. I thought there was a couple of questions that I wasn't able to answer while I was talking through some of these topics. I'm gonna to go back and get those. So if you didn't hear your question answered, hang on for a sec, I will answer that. Here's some conclusions about the Hive environment that we see a lot of our clients making. Hive allows searching all content. Doesn't matter what folder structure it's in on your system, all content is searchable. You saw when I was using Hive, really the only organizational structure that I was potentially limiting to was the library I chose to dump it in which is maybe your top, top level folder. That's it. Everything else, all searchable, instantly searchable. Hive searches all of the metadata of files, and that does include custom tags. So it searches the parameters, it searches the tags, it searches categories, it searches file names, it searches all of that. So I can search whatever I want, pretty much any time, filter by almost all of that stuff, and it's instantly available to the end user when you're searching, when you're working with tags, when you're working with parameters, all that stuff. You saw that content can be hosted either in the cloud or you can choose if you want to exclusively keep it on your own local network and not put it in the cloud. That's your choice. Depending on how you choose to do that, that kind of determines some of the functionality when users are outside your office, but you do have that choice. We're not making you put your content in the Hive cloud. When the content is available, they can find it in Hive, they can search it, they can drop it. Those users, they experience pretty much instant consumption of that content. Double click on it and it's loaded into their project or opened in whatever the editor happens to be. This does allow some design software specific consumption of that content. Revit's a special tool. It's different than AutoCAD. It's different than Microsoft Word. It doesn't just open. It actually loads stuff into the project with certain properties. You saw how it was able to load specific families with specific types even. That's all design software specific use of that content and Hive knows how to do that. Specifically for Hive and very soon for AutoCAD as well. And of course that user and group management can be done from any web browser. While I couldn't show it to you, if you've got an iPhone, iPad, Android phone, Android tablet, whatever, as I mentioned a couple of times, you can do all of that management directly from the web portal there at hive21.ctcsoftware.com. So you can get in there and try that all out. So how can you get your hands on this if you don't already have it? How can you try this out? Well, if I'm up here on, let me log out of this so you can actually see what this is gonna look like here. If I'm on the ctcsoftware.com website where you go for all of our other tools, ctcsoftware.com, 
when you go to products, there is a Hive option right here, and you can get started using Hive. You can try it free for 14 days. You can also just sign up to try it directly from the site itself, but you can try it free for 14 days. That'll get you a, a current trial. If you just go to sign up now and you've already got an account, you can simply sign in right from here. Sign in using your, your email, your password, sign in, that gets you direct access to the portal, or you can sign up from here as well and try and get a Hive product trial for 10 days. Number of users that you wanna try, make sure that it knows you're not a robot, of course, submit that, and then you know, you're good to go. You'll get a, an invite to be able to use Hive just like I was using it today, once you've got yours all set up. All right, so that's how you can get your hands on it. So after all that's kind of covered, let's go through some of the questions I didn't actually have time to answer while I was going through this. There was a question about number of items per page, right? Hive right now maximizes um, which, uh, how many items it can display on a single search page by default, just like Google does, right? You go to Google, you search, you get 20 items on a page, you click the next page, you get the next 20 items. Hive is very similar in that respect. If I clear this out, I clear out all my search strings here, um, this is going to give me here 100 items on this page, and if I want to get more, I can click load more. Keeps my first 100, gives me 100 more in my search results. Some people feel that's a bit limiting, and I understand that. Maybe you wanna have more content. We're actually taking a look at how we can make that experience better for you so you never actually see a load more content button. When you start scrolling down as you get towards the bottom, just like what Facebook does, just like what Pinterest does, we're working on building in what's called infinite scroll. So as you scroll, it just continually loads more, loads more, loads more. That helps us balance the load on our servers to keep high fast, but it gives you the experience and the thought of, you know, what does, um, you know, uh, what, what content am I getting? And I can just keep scrolling to find what I'm looking for. I will say, if you find yourself scrolling a lot, you probably should filter more. Not always realistic, but it's something that I would consider um, recommending to your users is to heavily leverage filters if they find themselves going two, three, four pages in. Um, there was a question about that tool that I used earlier when I was creating views. What tool was that? That was from the CTC software tab, a suite of tools called the BIM project suite. I can't pull it off the ribbon right now because my dragging in Windows is being limited by uh, the, the GoToWebinar here. But the tool specifically that I was using is called View Creator. It helps you with that view creation process. It can do uh, dependent views. It can do all kinds of really powerful things in that view creation, but it really helps streamline that project setup. And I always use this in collaboration with my template, which I always pull directly from Hive because I find that's the most efficient way to get my template and all content. But that's the tool that I was using, View Creator from the CTC BIM project suite. Um, there was a question specifically about versions that I saw. I think I answered it, but the question specifically was, if you have content in an older version and you're working in a newer version of Revit, can you insert that? Absolutely, Hive will just do the temporary upgrade just like it would if you did the normal load family from Windows. Um, it'll still give you the selectivity of being able to load specific types. So yes, you can use older content if you want. If you're gonna consistently do that, I would probably use that web option that I pointed out to disable the the previous version filtering basically where it actually right now it's filtering for my active revit version when i switch to Revit 2021 you see it flips to that i would probably turn that off if you find your team needing that more often than not because needing to constantly uncheck that filter might be frustrating for them but that's an option that you have in hive to disable that corporate wide there was a question about if you have projects filled with details and i'm going to add to that schedules, sheets, system families. Can you use Hive to bring in those drafting views? 100% yes. In fact, I've actually got a detail specific filter here that I need to set to Revit 2018 because I don't have any in 2021 yet. Um, yes, these are all drafting views that exist in one of my warehouse files, right? If I make these pictures bigger, you can see these are just two-dimensional drawings of things with lines and text and perhaps detail symbols laid out that are my typical details. If I was to click on one of these and pull up the details page here, 
uh, you'll notice that this Revit category is a view, specifically a drafting view. So you can absolutely have drafting views inside of here. I don't have schedules specifically in the list, but I do have sheets. You can, you can have specific sheets in the list. That is a Revit category that it knows about. And Revit schedules absolutely as well. So those are kind of some views that you can add directly into Hive, make searchable and loadable into your active project in the same way that you would Revit families. So yeah, again, one-stop shopping is the intent here. You can absolutely do that. Uh, there was a question about maximum storage capacity. Uh, we don't limit you to how much storage you can use. However, there is a single file size limit that is inflicted right now. 300 meg is the largest single file you can put into Hive. That limitation is there on purpose because we had some people who felt like they should be putting their Revit active project models in Hive and trying to work on them. That is not a proper use of Hive. That is not supported. BIM 360 is what that's for. Uh, you work on your projects out of BIM 360. Hive is simply where you get the content from. If your templates are larger than 300 meg in file size, let's have a conversation. I think you can get that trimmed down, especially when you're using Hive, because you can have them go to Hive for a lot of that content. Um, when will public libraries be available? Very, very soon, within the next two months, we expect you'll have public libraries able to be subscribed to. Um, our intent is less than two months, but absolutely within two months, those will be available. Um, I already answered the question about does the project activity track BIM 360 cloud models? Yes, absolutely. The project activity logging does work with BIM 360, does track those models, gives you all the same information. Fantastic tool for working with that, especially when people are working remote. Are tags separate from searching parameters? Yes, they are. Tags are subjective. Parameters are actually properties of families themselves. Parameters are automatically scanned. Tags are subjectively added by you and your team after content exists in Hive for further filtering by whatever subjective rules it is you want. For example, client-specific stuff. If you want to put client names on a tag and associate that with a family, you can do that. But that's subjective, and it is separate from parameters. It is also searchable, by the way, but it is separate from parameters. Um, how do you update Hive content from a warehouse file? Same way you added it in the first place. You go to the Add Content tab. With that project open, that warehouse opened up, you go to Add Revit Project Elements, and you just re-add the exact same thing back into Hive to the same library or libraries, and it will reprocess that content and replace the one that was already there. You simply reprocess it. We actually have a really smooth workflow for how you might reprocess families and other content. There's the ability for you to actually get a library report by exporting that content to a report in an Excel file. And you can turn back around and use this update function to have the, the Excel file auto scan your network for the original content. And if it finds date changes on that content, it will automatically throw it in here for processing. So you can actually save quite a bit of time that way. That particular function does not work with project elements, but it will warn you that that project is perhaps updated and you may need to, to actually reprocess that stuff. But again, you do the reprocessing of project elements the same way you add them in the first place. There is no need in Hive to delete content and reprocess that same content. Leave it there, just replace it, okay? That's what I recommend. Um, would I suggest utilizing tags versus parameters? Yeah, I gotta say, anything that's embedded in the family already as a property is already searchable. I use that as much as I possibly can. Uh, again, with tagging, I use it when subjectively there's something that's not in the, in the family. So something that relates it directly to a client uh, something that maybe relates it to a discipline and I need to subdivide it, maybe something that relates it to a subcategory of Revit or a sub practice group in my firm, I might tag those things. I might just as easily put those in separate libraries, but usually I try to keep as few libraries as possible and I'll rely on tags for some of that extra filtration where needed. What is the cost? That's a great question as well. The average cost of Hive is someplace around $10 per user per month, you know, 120 bucks a year on average. Sometimes if you're a really small firm, it's like $125 a year, something like that. If you're a very really large firm, it's more like $80 a year, give or take. I don't know exact numbers. That'd be something you want to talk with one of our sales reps on to get more information about it. Um, but yeah, Hive is really inexpensive 
uh, and it's per month and per year costs are really, really cheap compared to all the other solutions out there in the market that do pretty much this exact same thing. Hive is usually half or less than half their cost for equal or better functionality in, in almost all cases. Can Hive store view templates? That's a fantastic question. Um, right now, Hive does not do view templates. We are working toward that, so you can actually transfer view templates, but at the moment, Hive is not storing view templates within its environment. Near future, yes, that's absolutely on our roadmap. We are trying to get Hive to work better with view templates in a couple of other categories, but right now, um, it does not do view templates. All right, I haven't seen any additional questions roll in since uh, I started answering the questions here, other than that last one that I just answered. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you all. Thank you for your time today in this webinar. We really appreciate it when you show up live. We hope that this was informative for you and you're able to find some value out of the Hive environment. We encourage you, if you don't already own it, to try it out uh, and get a hold of us if you need to, to ask any more questions offline. But thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in future CTC webinars. Have a fantastic day.